Father, we settle our hearts before you, and I'm sure pretty much just about everybody in the room have been through circumstances where they have wondered, where are you? Why are you letting this happen? And the enemy is right there to say, how could God love you to do these things? May your word this morning be alive, may it be powerful. May your Holy Spirit truly speak to each person, Lord, in this room as though it were a conversation between you and them alone. I pray, Father, that you would work in us, Lord, that our lives might be changed. And I thank you for the very, just the beautiful types that we see here and the wonderful history you've recorded for us in this life of Joseph. Be with us now, Lord. Touch each heart in the room as only you can, in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 43, verse 17, The man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. The men were afraid, because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, Because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time, are we brought in, that he might seek occasion against us to take us for bondmen and our donkeys. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house, and said, O oh, sir, <clears throat> we came down indeed at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass when we came to the inn that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. And we have brought it again in our hand, and other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you. Fear not, your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought them Simeon up before them or unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house and they gave them water and they, gave, they washed their feet and they gave their donkeys provender. And they made ready to present, sorry, they made ready the present against Joseph as he came at noon for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare, and said, Is your father well, the old man, of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? And they answered, Thy servant our father is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. And he lifted up his eyes, and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother, of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste for his bowels, his heart did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber, and he wept there. He washed his face, and he went out, and he refrained himself, and said, Set on bread. And they set on for him by himself, and for them by themselves, and for the Egyptians which did eat with him by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians." And they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled one at another. And he took and sent messes, or the idea is platters, unto them that were before him. But Benjamin's platter, his food, his mess, was five times so much as any of the others. And they drank, and they were merry with him. And this would be that first test. When he gave the extra honor to Benjamin, he's watching to see whether or not they had a problem with that. They seem to pass that test. And so he called his steward, steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. Now why do this again? And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money, and he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. And as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city, and yet not far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? You have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. The poor guys just get out of town. They're like, oh, we, <laughs> we made it. And then they hear like, doo -doo 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 behind them, you know, like, and they get to, what are you doing stealing my master's cup? 
Don't you know that he can divine or does divination in that cup? And the Egyptians, as well as other cultures, were known for taking a bowl or a cup and they would put water or wine in it and they would look for the light and the ripples and sometimes they would put objects inside the cup. Some would float, some would sink. They would see how they line up and they would use that to, to quote, divine or to discern different things, future, yes or no answers, whatever the case may be. It was a known practice among the Egyptians. I do not personally think Joseph practiced divination. But again, remember the story here is that he's an Egyptian as far as they know, and they're the Hebrews. And so when he sends his servant, he has this idea of you've taken my cup, I use it to divine, could I not know that you stole this? But think about it. If he uses that cup for divination to figure out things, then when they steal it, how could he divine they took it? Anyway, there's a little humor here. So the servant overtook them, spake to him the same words. And they said to him, verse 7, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servant should do according to this thing. You, man, you Egyptians, will you just leave us alone? Every time we meet you people, you accuse us. You tell us we're spies. You tell us we're this, we're that. Now you're telling us we're thieves. Enough already. Behold, verse 8, the money which we found in our sack's mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we will also be my Lord's bondmen. I wonder who proposed that. I th but now it's not about gaining. T it's a little unstable there. Just kill him, and we'll be your slaves. Smells like Reuben answering. And the steward said, Now also let it be according unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and you shall be blameless. And then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack. And the steward searched, and he began at the eldest. And I think as he worked his way down, they were getting more defiant. What are you, you're wasting your time. And he left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Why? Then when they steal, did they steal the money the first time it was in their sacks? What's the answer? No. So were they guilty of any theft the first time? What's the answer? No. If he had only put the cup in Benjamin's sack, that would be harder because then they would have this question, did he take it? Did he not take it? Did he take it? But when the money is in all of their sacks and the cup is also in Benjamin's sack, what's pretty clear to him? They didn't take anything. Once again, somehow things have shown up in their sacks. In other words, what they would understand from this is Benjamin's innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. Everybody with me? When they sold Joseph at the age of 17, was he innocent? Yep. Had he done anything wrong? Really? Nope. And so they found the cup that calls upon the name of the Lord in sack. This is now the second test. You see, it's the second test because the first time when they had Joseph, who just, you know, irritated them, when they figured out a way to get rid of daddy's little favorite, they sold him, you remember the story by now, and they sold him the Ishmaelites, and away he went, and they went home, divided up the silver, and all told the same story. Must have been torn by a wild beast. Now, the stakes are not gaining a little extra money and getting rid of daddy's favorite, who's a nuisance. Now, Benjamin is daddy's favorite, the replacement. But now it's not about gaining 20 pieces of silver. If they go down with him, then they're going to be put in jail or executed, whatever the case may be. They're not going to go home. They're not going to bring any grain. Their wives are not going to have food. Their children are not going to have food. This is not about making a few bucks. This time the test is about self-preservation of themselves and their families. Whole different set of circumstances. But the same setup. So what would they do? Verse 13, they rent their clothes, a sign of outward grief. They ripped their clothes. They laid in every man his ass, put their donkeys, the stuff back on their donkeys, and they returned to the city. And Judah, interesting, he's in the lead, and his brethren came to Joseph's house. Look at this, for he was yet there. Wonder why. And they fell before him on the ground. 
And Joseph said unto them, again, I think he's using interpreter for sake of this test. What deed is this that you have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine the ideas? Don't you know I can divine these things? And Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? For God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Wait a second. Did they steal the money? Did they steal the cup? Have they done anything wrong here? Not in taking a cup or money. But they have stolen something. They stole the favorite son of their father because of envy and because of hatred. And they took him and they threw him in a pit. And then they wouldn't hear his cries. Then they sold him to Ishmaelites who dragged him down to Egypt and sold him as a slave. They stole a man's son that he loved. They threw him out basically, kept the money and lied about it. They realized that sin has been found out. Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he with whom the cup is found. Which means they're not going to go home, which means their families most likely will starve. Have they changed? Come on. This is different than before, isn't it? But let's see what happens. And Joseph said, God forbid that I should do so. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Test number three. You're off the hook. Go home. Don't worry about him. Then Judah came near unto Joseph and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. And again, I think through an interpreter. And this answer, by the way, I don't think Joseph is prepared for. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. So Benjamin, Joseph just learned, became the replacement favorite. Joseph just learned that. When I was gone, Pop focused on Benjamin. He's now the favorite. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall not see my face, or you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again, and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bear me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces. What did Joseph just learn? The cover story. And again, I think it's coming through an interpreter, and he's going to have to, he's got to keep this, like, cool here. He's, he's, I wonder, he's just going, Surely he is torn in pieces. And I saw him not since. And if you take this, Benjamin, also from me, and mischief befall him, you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Joseph is learning of just how deep the pain was in Jacob's life when he thought he lost him. Bad enough I lost Joseph, but if I lose Benjamin, that's it, I'm done. And I can't help but think that emotion is starting to pour into Joseph. Anger, they lied to him. Grieving. Dad has been believing this lie for so long. His heart has been broken. Sorrow. A longing to be reunited with his dad. There's a lot of stuff starting to churn inside this man as he's listening to Judah. And so Judah continued, Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. 
And it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. Joseph now understands, perhaps, how much he's been missed. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. And I think Joseph's fighting to hold it together now. For thy servant became a surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go. Judah is not asking for mercy. He is asking to suffer on behalf of Benjamin. And if you think about it, he's asking also to suffer on behalf of his father. Better me to suffer than see my dad heartbroken because he hasn't come home. Take me as your slave. Let him go. Has Judah changed? Oh, yeah. You know, throughout this history of Joseph, there have been so many what are called types. Types are Christianese. Christianese is language among believers that the unbelievers don't understand until they get saved. Types are essentially a foreshadowing. And there are things in Joseph's life that foreshadows the Lord Jesus himself. And there are many of them. We could spend hours on it. But in this text, Judah is one of the most powerful foreshadowings of the Lord Jesus Christ you can find. And that is, for the sake of his brothers and to bring pleasure to his father, he is willing to sell himself to redeem others. That is the whole death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And when he rose from the grave, we know that the payment has been accepted by the Father. And that is why for those of us who come to Christ by faith, we're called sons and daughters of God. And that's why Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father, even as he wrestled in the garden in Gethsemane. Father, if as I will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. There as they would nail him to a cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then finally, shortly before he would release or dismiss his spirit, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did those things for us. He was innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. But God so loves you and God so loves me that he would send his son to take our place under his wrath and his punishment and his judgment so that if we would receive him in our hearts by faith, we can be adopted as sons and daughters in the kingdom of God. God is not against you. God has done everything to bring you to himself, but he will not force you. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad. A bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up to his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father? And then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by. This would be his servants, his attendants, and his personal steward. He could not refrain himself before them that stood by, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And they're all the Egyptians like, whoa, what's with that? Okay, you know, and they all go, okay. The interpreter looks at him and goes, hmm. And while he's doing this, we know what he's about to do. He's trying to hold it together. Now, why send them out? We'll see it in a minute. Every man go out from me. And there stood no man with him. And the, the brothers had to be alarmed, like, what is this? You know, they're all moving backward. There stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And Joseph wept aloud and just broke down. So much so that the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. So they just hear him just starting to sob and to weep. And it's echoing down those stone hallways of his house. And they just hear him just wailing. He wept aloud, and as he wept aloud, verse 3, Joseph said unto his brethren, trying to probably grab a breath, I'm Joseph. And at first, they, you know, they hear now their language, Hebrew, they're like, what? What do you say? And he's trying to hold it together. I am Joseph. And you can see him going, oh. and wait a minute, the guy says he can divine. He got us all in the right order in our seats. Maybe he just knows the name. But shock had to be going through them. 
I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled, literally, to be overwhelmed like an army facing disaster. They are terrified at his presence. They can't believe it. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me. Why would he have to say that? Because they're, right? Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Nobody knew that. Who just was shocked? Who? Who's the one person in that room who doesn't know this? Benjamin. You were sold? You sold him? You sold him? And you told dad all that time and he was, you sold him? I think it got hot. How do I know? Next verse. <laughs> now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. Why is that there? Because they were grieved and angry. Benjamin's going, you sold him? And they're just getting lower and lower. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me. Why did he send out the servants? Because the sin of his brothers against him is none of their business. And sadly, we forget this. When someone offends you or sins against you, you know what you should do? Matthew 18 says, go to them. Don't email them. Don't text them. Don't you know, phone call them. Eyeball to eyeball. Go to them. Tell them what they've done. If they hear you, you've gained your brother. If they don't, then you go get a witness or two and straighten it out with them. Problem is, too many people, someone offends them, they go to everybody else first. I, I, well, I don't like what he did either. I don't either. I just think that's horrible. Have you talked to him? No, I won't talk to you, so I feel better. <laughs> Joseph sent them out of the room. It's none of their business. I'll deal with it with us. This is where the sin is. Don't forget that. How does God deal with our sin? Between us and him. Therefore be ye not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Jacob has been able to understand in spite of the dire circumstances he has been placed in, the heartache, the false accusations, and the longing to be free. He has been able to have the maturity to realize that behind these things men have done to him, God had allowed it and God had a plan. And there are some of you sitting in this room, you still, maybe you won't even come to the Lord because much pain has been inflicted on you as a child or an adult or as a married person or whatever the case may be. And you're saying, how can there be a God of love when these wicked things have been allowed to happen in my life? And yet those wicked things have you sitting in this chair this morning wanting to hear about what does God say and does he love me? He does. Joseph is a man who understood that truly all things do indeed work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. What man meant for evil, Joseph can see the overriding hand of God doing in his life. Can you see that? And yet you have so much more than Joseph to meditate on, to consider all these histories of God always being faithful. Right here. He didn't have this. You sold me hither. But God did send me before you to preserve life. The dream is now finally making sense. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there, there shall be neither earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity, literally the idea, a remnant in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God, literally the God, the God of our family, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, an advisor, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And you can see they're all still trying to take it in like, oh. I wonder if Benjamin's still going, they sold him. They sold him. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, for we're out of time. And we have to come back next week. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father God, how we thank you for your word.
And Lord, I pray for those this morning, they have had a long, painful life. And they have wondered, where were you? In fact, there are some here who are so angry with you, Lord, because of that long, painful life. It is keeping them from truly opening their hearts to you by faith. God is light. In him there is no darkness. There is no shadow of turning. God cannot be tempted with evil. He's holy. You haven't caused these things. But you are so powerful that you can work in spite of these things to make us fit for heaven. If those pains are what were needed to get us to get our eyes off of ourself and to look up to you and to cry out, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, then one day when we stand before you in heaven, forgiven, redeemed, in glorified bodies, we'll have no further questions because it was worth it. But for those right now, Lord, whose faith is failing, strengthen them, encourage them. You know what you're doing. You will bring them to an expected end. Plans that you have for them are for good. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, He loves you, He has paid for you, but you have to receive Him. You have to draw near and ask for His forgiveness. If you will do those things, the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you, Lord. Go with us this day and meet us in your word as we continue in our quiet time this week. In Jesus' name, amen.